Hello, and welcome to Spaceflight Histories, a channel dedicated to telling the history of space exploration. My name is Erin, and today we're looking at some of the concepts of advanced Gemini. NASA's Project Gemini, which ran from 1961 to 1966, was the bridge from Project Mercury to Project Apollo. All tasks astronauts would have to perform on their journey to and from the moon were tested and perfected during Gemini, including rendezvous, docking, extravehicular activities, and eating space food. While the 12 missions of Project Gemini utilized a larger and more sophisticated Mercury capsule, multiple modifications would have allowed the spacecraft to perform versatile missions, everything from docking with the space station to landing on the moon. Big Gemini, also known as Big G, was proposed as a resupply vessel for space stations. In 1967, it was pitched by McDonnell Douglas to NASA and the U.S. Air Force, who were both developing their own separate space stations, the Apollo Applications Program Orbital Workshop, which would become Skylab, and the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, or MOLE, respectively. MOLE was a proposed military reconnaissance station. Space stations planned for the late 1970s would have been manned by crews of anywhere from 6 to 24 people and would have required multiple resupply missions that existing spacecraft could not handle. Big G would have been able to fit 9 to 12 astronauts at one time, far more than the space shuttle would carry, as well as 12 metric tons of cargo. Due to its large size, it would have launched on a heavy lift rocket, such as the Titan 3M or the Saturn INT-20, neither of which made it past the drawing board. Big G would have the same hatch and heat shield configuration as the Gemini B, which we'll get to in a minute, and the cargo module could be accessed through a pressurized tunnel, no EVA necessary. Additionally, it would have docked aft and first to move cargo in and out of the space station. The crew module would have a volume of 660 cubic feet, a length of 38 feet, and a diameter of 14 feet. The Air Force configuration had a cylindrical maneuvering and cargo module so it could fit on Titan boosters. The NASA configuration had a conical module so it could fit atop Saturn rockets. Due to its size, Big G would have been unable to make a water landing and instead would have returned to a designated site on land using skids and a parasail. If everything was to progress as scheduled, and if Big G received the funding it needed, mm -hmm. operational flights would have started by 1971. However, Orbital Workshop 1, or Skylab, which was planned for 1970, would not be operational until 1973. NASA spent the rest of the 1960s and early 1970s landing men on the moon, and the MOLE program was terminated in June 1969. By this time, the Gemini spacecraft and all the concepts derived from it were obsolete. Blue Gemini was both the spacecraft and a program conceived as a joint Air Force-NASA project. Proposed in the summer of 1962, the program's purpose was to prepare Air Force astronauts to fly manned orbital development system missions, the predecessor to the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, by having them fly with NASA Gemini astronauts. After two joint flights, two Air Force astronauts would fly Blue Gemini missions together while still performing tasks for NASA. Finally, Three dedicated Blue Gemini missions would finish qualifying Air Force astronauts for long-duration military spaceflight and develop rendezvous and docking procedures for future space station missions. The Blue Gemini program would have used the same spacecraft NASA's Gemini program used for its 12 flights, but the project's paper lifespan lasted only six months. In January 1963, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara canceled the program after determining the military experiments proposed for Blue Gemini could be flown on NASA missions instead. In December 1963, the Manned Orbital Development System was revived and renamed to the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, which brings us to our next concept vehicle, the Gemini B. Gemini B was the most tangible advanced Gemini proposal because it actually flew in space. It was developed from Mole and was a standard Gemini capsule with a round hash cut through the heat shield to allow astronauts access to the laboratory attached beneath them. It and the laboratory module would launch together on board the Titan 3M launch vehicle, and once in orbit, the astronauts would power down the Gemini and enter the lab. When it was time to return to Earth after about 40 days in orbit, the crew would power up the Gemini B, separate from the single-use station, and re-enter splashing down in the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean and being retrieved by Navy spacecraft recovery forces. 
but there was a huge risk that came with using the Gemini B. If the heat shield was not properly intact during reentry, a risk caused by the rear hatch, the crew would burn up and die. In order to validate the Gemini B's unique hatch and heat shield configuration and the launch configuration for future mole missions, a prototype was flown. The previously flown Gemini 2 capsule, formerly Gemini spacecraft number 2, a decommissioned Titan I first stage oxidizer tank serving as a mock laboratory designated orbiting vehicle 4 3, and a trans stage, or the upper stage of a Titan III rocket, made up the OPS 0855 boilerplate spacecraft. On November 3, 1966, a Titan 3C rocket, serial number 3C 9, lifted off from Launch Complex 40 on Cape Kennedy and carried OPS 0855 to space. While the Mach Laboratory stayed in orbit for 30 days, the Gemini B was released onto a suborbital trajectory after launch and became the first capsule to fly in space twice. It was recovered near Ascension Island in the South Atlantic by the USS LaSalle. While the flight was a success, the Gemini B concept, like Big Gemini, was abandoned after Mole was terminated in June 1969 and the unique test article is now on display at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Museum at Launch Complex 26 on Cape Canaveral. Gemini Paraglider, officially called the Paraglider Landing System Program, was the proposal to use a Regalo wing and a set of wheels or skids to land the Gemini capsule on the ground after re-entry. A Regalo wing, also called a para wing, is a flexible, two-lobed, self-inflating cross between a kite and a parachute. In 1964 and 1965, three manned Gemini paraglider test articles called test tow vehicles were towed and dropped by helicopter to test the functionality of the Regalo wing for spacecraft recovery. This method of landing was unfavored due to delays in development and failures in testing, as the final test occurred after the success of Gemini 3 in March 1965 and was no longer of interest to NASA. This is how the big Gemini capsule would have landed as well. Test Tow Vehicle 1 is now on display at the Stephen F. Udvar-Hazy Center in Virginia. Shortly after the cancellation of its X-20 Dynamic Soar space plane program in 1962, the Air Force proposed the use of a winged Gemini capsule for manned spaceflight. The unique wings were developed and tested during the ASSET program, which stands for Aerothermodynamic Elastic Structural System Environmental Test, and was used to study the overall reliability of winged vehicles in space with emphasis on reentry. However, the winged Gemini was not designed to maneuver in orbit. To do so, it would have needed to launch on a Titan 3A or Titan 3C rocket and use the trans stage for maneuvering. If maneuvering was not a concern, it would have launched on the standard Gemini Titan II launch vehicle that NASA used. McDonnell Aircraft also proposed a version of the capsule that would have been capable of a piloted runway landing. The spacecraft Icarus from the 1969 film Planet of the Apes draws inspiration from the asset vehicle and the X-20. There were also multiple proposals to use modified Gemini spacecraft for manned lunar flights, though I won't be going into every one of them in detail. The earliest dates back to 1961, when the Gemini program was called Mercury Mark II. McDonnell Aircraft and James Chamberlain, the chief designer of the Gemini spacecraft and the project's first manager, favored sending Gemini spacecraft to the moon. He was particularly in favor of any lunar Gemini plans utilizing lunar orbit rendezvous, or launching two small spacecraft, an orbiter and a lander, on one large rocket and having them fly to the moon together. This proposal was put forth by engineer John C. Hubble in 1960 though he did not invent the concept himself. Chamberlain was the first member of the Space Task Group to advocate for this method of landing men on the moon, as opposed to Earth Orbit Rendezvous or Lunar Direct Ascent, and Lunar Orbit Rendezvous was chosen as the official lunar landing method in 1962. A lunar Gemini mission using the Earth Orbit Rendezvous method would have eliminated the need for developing the heavy lift Saturn V rocket, by having two rockets with different payloads launch separately and rendezvous and dock in low Earth orbit. The most notable lunar Gemini EOR proposal was Gemini Centaur, which would have seen the Centaur upper stage launch atop a Titan II rocket with the Gemini spacecraft launching atop another. 
Gemini Centaur would have been able to achieve a 72-hour circumlunar flight for not significantly more money than the planned Apollo missions were projected to. However, there were concerns that the Gemini heat shield could not provide the spacecraft with enough protection during the higher speed ballistic reentry associated with returning from the moon, and a thicker heat shield with more insulation would have made the capsule too heavy to launch atop a Titan II. A lunar Gemini mission using the Lunar Direct Ascent method would have utilized the Saturn V in a massive four-stage lunar lander. A modified Gemini spacecraft would have served as the reentry module. 1964 brought about the proposal to use a Saturn 1B to launch Gemini to the moon, either during the gap between the end of the Gemini program and the beginning of the Apollo program, or as a contingency to beat the Soviet Union to the moon if Apollo suffered severe delays. If any of you have seen the 1967 movie Countdown, you know what I'm talking about. NASA's safety review of the Apollo program following the Apollo 1 disaster in 1967 prompted McDonnell Aircraft to propose the Universal Lunar Rescue Vehicle, a system with the capability of rescuing an Apollo crew at just about any point during a lunar mission. It included an enlarged capsule with room for five astronauts, two pilots, and the three members of the rescued crew. It was considered, but ultimately rejected due to lack of funding. The Gemini Lunar Orbit Rescue Vehicle would have been used to retrieve a crew stranded in orbit around the moon while the Gemini Lunar Surface Rescue spacecraft would have retrieved a pair of astronauts stranded on the surface. The Gemini Lunar Surface Survival Shelter would have been sent to the moon ahead of the manned Apollo mission and landed close to the mission's planned landing site. If the Apollo Lunar Module's ascent stage failed to ignite when it came time to leave the surface, the astronauts would perform a final EVA to the survival shelter. However, the shelter was not designed to take off after landing, so a different spacecraft, either the Gemini Lunar Surface Rescue spacecraft or another Apollo mission, would be sent to pick up the crew. While Advanced Gemini proposed a number of modifications to the Gemini spacecraft, none are as iconic as the baseplate itself. Its use in the program gave some of the most famous astronauts their first flights in space, and both flown capsules and test articles are on display all across the United States. Thanks for watching, and be sure to leave a like and comment on this video. My Advanced Gemini web article is linked in the description below, and if you want more space history, hit subscribe, and I'll see you next time.